Many people think that homelessness is something that is downtown a community or a large city. They don't literally think about how homelessness begins. They don't often literally think about how homelessness stays in some people's lives, and they practically don't think about what they might do to help someone if they're faced with a person that's homeless. In my life, I never dreamed I'd ever be homeless. My family ensured that I had a solid education and learned a lot of ways about the world today and how to be professional, how to shake hands, how to literally talk to people, how to get them to think, how to help them to learn, and my language school was successful for a long time. Then someone decided to steal something from it, and that was sort of an impact on my uh, life in terms of my trust of the classroom as well as the people who were coming via special invitation to literally learn in my particular private location where we allowed students to be with their shoes off and their minds open to learn the Japanese language. Practically, it wasn't quite enough income for my family, so I would take the occasional marketing job. Really, that is my true forte writing. My Indiana University journalism degree put me in that place of seeing things, of openly knowing procedures, and getting how to handle things came about from manufacturing experience. I literally learned from some of the leading minds in the Japanese manufacturing world of how to do preventive maintenance. Now, preventive maintenance is not something that perhaps every company literally talks about, but preventive maintenance is about how do we prevent problems from occurring for us, whether they be legal or whether they be uh, relational, it doesn't really matter because all relationships that are legal are actually personal. You see, it's interpersonal relationships that makes a person be able to succeed in life. And there are moments in time when a person is going through so much difficulty that they're struggling with, how do I stay positive? How do I let people know that this particular process, if just slightly changed, would be so much literally easier for any other person? who might be going through this stage. And it also might limit the people who are abusing the situation, literally not needing the additional help, but are coming and getting free food or free services that really don't need it. And I've seen that happen a few occasions. It was just an impression I had, that the individual wasn't really that impoverished. They just didn't want to pay for certain things. And they thought, hey, this is a great program. I can participate because I'm a member of this particular organization. And maybe there are folks like that in the world, but I was never an individual like that. It's very humbling to be in a moment of homelessness. I've actually learned how to survive by myself for a long time. You see, when I reach out to old colleagues, people who came to my networking forum, they just literally kind of look by me. They don't really see the life that I'm leading and they don't really understand how could that man possibly become homeless. Some of them don't even acknowledge the fact that I am homeless because they're not listening to my audio cast. They're not listening to the podcast that I've done with folks. And openly, I wasn't in that position when I was doing those podcasts. I literally had a home until someone lied about me and sort of helped to ruin my legal record. Then I had family members who literally ruined my opportunities in life with regard to their litigational abuse and their psychological warfare on my life. I can really say it like that because when I research it myself to make sure that I'm not misunderstanding literally what's going on in those relationships, that is what the leading professionals in those worlds and realms say it's called. So I'm sure that I'm not promising the world to people at this moment in time, but I am someone who has the ability and skill sets to do a lot of things. I literally could take a pastor's sermon and rip it apart and put it into a position that would maybe help that individual to reach more hearts, minds, and souls for the Lord in heaven. I literally can take a Japanese language, break it down, and make it as simple as possible that so that any person in a room could learn some language about of a foreign country that a lot of people feel is really, really hard to learn. I learned how to create a process from working in manufacturing, and from those typical standardized protocols, I have learned how to develop programs. I literally do that with most of my independent professional clients who needed to figure out how to get their business working more successfully for them versus less time wasted and poor time management skills that it's not really kind to say to a professional today, but in truth, if they don't really have a schedule book that's really pre-planned well, it means that they're letting their businesses run them and supposed of them running their business. Now, there are many people in different generations who literally think that any person who complains is a problem child. And in truth, I don't see it as that. You see, in risk management type of work, 
Our goals are to help a core organization prevent all the possible litigational issues that could arise from a poorly handled situation. Now, what do I mean by that? I literally mean that employees represents large firms and how they handle something, whether it puts a person in a position of success or triumph, or whether it literally puts that person in a more difficult position in life, creates a litigational situation. You see, in life, we have many people who like to believe they're helping, and many of them do. But, you know, help to other people is not a standardized process. That is one organizational thing that I was, was so impressed with when I visited the Good Samaritan Network with uh, Nancy, who's been the executive director and the founder for a little eon of time. I seriously don't want to date a lady in terms of her age and years and, and her seasoning, as I like to call it. But in truth, she really just understood this problem that I was in. She took care of the two immediate things that she could see that were logical. She allowed me to reject little parts of what she was thinking of providing me, realizing that not every human being can eat a particular type of food. Some people have sensitivities that they have learned over the course of their entire lifetime that they can just simply say, gosh, it's kind of you to offer that, but unfortunately my body doesn't process that type of in type of food or seasoning or the various um, chemicals, etc., that are put in certain foods to keep them preserved. I guess they're called preservatives. It takes my mind a little bit sometimes to recall all the language in English because I do have two languages that run around in my mind. And I sometimes curse in the foreign language just to be polite. But it's really not polite for a man of God or a man who believes in Christ or any person of faith or a, pro or a professional philosophy to do a lot of cursing. But in life, we have moments of time when life doesn't go the way we really want it to. Sometimes in life, it's just one series of crises after another, only interrupted by a major crisis. At least that's what the leading sales guru, Brian Tracy, says. And I've literally listened to a lot of his work. My brother was kind of a responsible for that. But that's about the only thing that I valued in those moments of time. Was I was learning a lot about listening skills. And I was learning a lot that in listening, it's never about my emotions. You see, the minute that I allow my emotions to carry into listening to someone else, I've totally lost Christ in that moment. You see, in my take on the world and in my take on the belief of a Jesus loving person that existed long ago and what he's done to serve as an example for the rest of us, that loving people forward is literally our responsibility in life as Christians or people of faith or spiritualists or whatever metaphysical oriented terminology that you would like to say. Now, why do I say metaphysical? Because the Holy Spirit is ever present. We literally know of stories where people have felt their cars lifted off of them and there was no one there that they could see who did it. And that man who, or woman who helped them in that moment of time totally vanished. The Catholics attribute this to angels. They literally talk about them. They talk about the saints and the lessons that the martyrs and other folks in history learned and taught the world about religion. But openly, in some mainstream Christian practices, people have literally forgotten the path of Jesus. You see, the path of Jesus was to go on a walk. A walkabout, if you will, to steal an Australian term, but he would literally go on a walk and he would let people who were interested in him follow him. Now, isn't that interesting? That if we love the Lord, we follow his principles. But how do we make sure we're following his principles in any moment of time? How do we make sure that our interests and our emotions are not out of whack with what literally needs to happen for that person in front of us? That is something that this gift of tool that my loving friend, Jill, showed me. She didn't exactly show me this part of it. I discovered that over the course of time in pursuit of understanding more of the trinity of the Christ life tree. But in reality, that loving thing she did for me in that moment of time to show me that there is a God's energy that flows through us and around us, much like the force in my favorite film, Star Wars, is literally there. And because she was loving me in that moment as a friend, as a colleague, as a soulful partner of sorts, she literally showed me something she learned on a, an event she went to for ladies. And since that day, my life has never been the same. I literally have been able to pick up what is right for me and what is wrong for me, and I've submitted it all. Now, when we talk about purposeful submission to the Lord or to whatever 
deity it is that we literally believe in. And a lot of people in different walks of faith and different ethnic groups have all sorts of those symbols all over their vehicles. Those who are of a Catholic, Catholic faith, they might have a um, rosary beads hanging from their mirrors in their vehicles. Those who are of Chinese background might have um, spiritual uh, messages that are utilized in Buddhism or Taoism or whatever practical thing they're listening to. I know literally in Japan, we would go and purchase prayers during the holidays. Christmas was more of a eat cake from the British con countries, little fiasco. And then literally uh, going to the shrine on New Year's Eve was more important. And then on New Year's Day, I'm sorry, going to the Buddhist temple on New Year's Eve, uh, I'm going to get backwards probably, but that's okay. It's been a little while since I've been able to do that because we don't have those things in Indiana, sadly. But anyway, we would go to the temple on one day and the very next day we would go to the shrine. And it's sort of interchangeable. Some people would do them in reverse just to avoid the crowds. But openly, we would also have prayer altars in our homes in Japan. Literally a place with a gong that would allow us to pray not only to the deity that we believed in and the various saints, etc., that came through that particular country, but also to our ancestors who were literally thought to be watching over us, very much like the Christian faith here thinks. That literally our loved ones have crossed over to the other side using a lexicon of the material world today and that have and or have transitioned to a heavenly plane. You see, it doesn't really matter the language that we use when we're talking about God. It's really more about the process and understanding of how do we make sure that we are producing in our lives an opportunity for other people to feel loved, cherished, and secure in those moments of time. When we throw people out of programming because we are feeling attacked or disrespected or disregarded, we might need to stop and go, okay, wait a second. Am I learning something in this moment in time about myself, about my own spirituality, about my own maturity, about my own little walk with God and Jesus and whether or not I'm modeling forgiveness, whether or not I'm saying, okay, I'm going to pull my emotions out of the situation right now and I'm going to look at this person's life through their eyes, that they literally have lost maybe everything in life. Maybe they lost a spouse. Do I know what it's like to lose a spouse? Maybe they lost a child. Do I know literally what it's like to lose a child? Maybe they've lost an employment situation that was really good for their life. Do I really know what it's like to lose a resource of revenue or income in my life to the point that it makes all the bills get more cumbersome, more difficult, more challenging to pay? Have I really understood homelessness for the people who are living in homelessness and poverty? There are many men who haven't quite produced a full-on life and they do get supplemental support from local food banks and other things. They're still making a living. But then there are literally homeless who have not been able to find a new job. They may not be able to find a new job because the work that they did has timed out in words of technology and animation and robotics and all the things that have literally come on the scenes in the last 20th century that puts their position out of work. Or perhaps, literally, it's a human relational situation. Now, in most people's cases, it's very easy for a group of people who are not literally on the same soul path as an individual to proclaim that a person is difficult to work with. But I have to wonder, would Jesus actually do that? Would Jesus Christ actually say about someone that the Father in heaven created and put into the body and the spirit of an individual that was manifested from parental loins, would Jesus literally say that person is a difficult soul? Because wouldn't that be somewhat blasphemous to say that something literally that the Lord God had created was difficult? Now, what is difficulty in our lives? Difficulty is something that we learn from. Difficult is something that produces better relationships. Difficulty and challenges in communication is literally something that moves us further in our life path, whether our life path be in employment for some organization or whether our life path be in volunteering for something philanthropic. You see, most people go into these situations thinking they've got all the tools in the tool shed to handle every single person that comes along because it's usually people that bring us the situations that we're facing. You see, I might sit in a parking lot with my trunk up meaning my the cover for the engine. And I'm probably, because of my fatigue, saying the wrong actual hood 
mechanism that covers that part of the vehicle. And I might sit in a parking lot with it up all day long and not one person in our world will stop and say, I noticed your hood is up. Is everything literally okay with your vehicle? Have you had a chance to call for some help? Do you need some help? And practically, if there's help that you need, would you allow me the permission to help you? You see, permission is something we don't think a lot about these days. We do a lot of presumption and assumption about what our rights are in other people's lives. We literally think that because I'm emotional about this particular issue, that I have the right to do something in someone's life. And that is not necessarily the case because if we make that choice, isn't it as though we are lording over that person's life? Now let's think about that word lord. Lord came about long ago in the Bible, in the book of Genesis, but it also came about through the eons of history of lords and ladies who literally ran countries, who literally ran land, who kept the people in line with their forces, who literally helped people to go on in life. Now in America, we don't really have the lords and ladies that they do in Europe. And even though they're still lords and ladies, they become more common folk. They have money and the support of the local government, of taxes, of liens, of whatever it may be on the land that they own. But they don't have quite the same positions of power that they once did, where everybody bowed down to them. So when we're practically talking about how we're feeling about a particular situation in a person's life, we have to literally ask ourselves, do we really have the right to feel about someone else's position in life? You see, it's not our life. And if we try to make a person do something, if we try to force something upon them, are we then therefore not producing the concept of lording over someone? In my life, I've had a lot of people try to lord over me in the last three years. I was lorded over by someone I would long to marry. And I just couldn't handle it at that moment in time because literally I was in the midst of losing someone that was important to me. Then a little later, I lost someone else who really was important to my soul and it's healing from those loss. <clears throat> but practically, she decided to lord something over me, which was not factual or true, but it became a legal record. Later, I ran into some difficulties with family because I was losing my career. I was losing my job. I was losing my life partner that made one of my programs that was the most profitable sort of less important. Because when you build something for a family to do together, it's a little bit hard to continue on in it when someone departs or someone transitions to the, the heavenly plane. Most people don't really think about the legacy of their life early on in their life. Men who have lots of power and lots of money do. They start to think about legacy planning and who's going to take over if I die and croak tomorrow and literally or if I get hit by a Mack truck, which is what a lot of people in the insurance industry will say. Look, if you get hit by a Mack truck tomorrow, you want to make sure these things are paid in full. I was just about to pay my various life insurance policies, when someone at an old employer of mine decided to puncture my tire with a slow leak so that the money I just produced in that moment of time of returning something that would was legitimately my right to get my money back on since I no longer needed it, well, ended up getting consumed for the repair of that vehicle tire. So the food I needed for the next month was no longer able to be purchased. The money I needed for gas was completely stolen from me in that moment of time because literally someone decided to gossip. They literally decided to go back to an assistant manager that I was not planning on meeting that day, communicate that this that my eye was in the store, sneak herself back to the position where she was supposed to be in the greeting moment of time, and literally then he came over and took over the, old, the entire sale. Now this is the assistant manager who ought to be able to do something in a matter of two to three minutes. That manager took his sweet time to do every little thing. Then lo and behold, it, it being the only place that I visited on my day that at that point in time, my tire was then all of a sudden no longer functioning. I got maybe five minutes away and the entire thing fell apart. That cost me almost $300 in repairs, money that I literally did not have on my person. You see, there are monsters in this world and in this lifetime, which I sort of alluded to in the last audio series. My life little life is not important to most people, but your life is important to you. And if you're still with me, then you're getting this, me this message that when the Lord God puts someone on your path, it's there for, and he's there, she's there for literally one reason, to prove who you are in the Lord God's house. Might be it. To allow you to show what your Jesus concept 
allows you to do for that individual, whether it be for free or for a paid service. But openly, people don't always think about that when they make decisions and rash ones about their emotions, about how they feel about what someone said to them. You see, you can't understand what someone said to them if you're not literally willing to listen to their logic. And if you think you've got someone else's logic completely down, then you've literally just said, I am Lord your God in heaven. Now let's talk about that. When you make the presumption that you know what someone is literally thinking, nine times out of the ten, we've already kind of proven in marketing, that is not the case. So many times salesmen miss the opportunity to follow up on something that a person was thinking about and wanted to ask a question on because they literally kept talking. They kept interrupting. This morning, I had a woman say to me, you never allowed me to speak. I'm like, I'm not done talking. When you, I'm done talking, I'm more than happy to allow you to speak. But the problem was she wasn't willing to listen. She wasn't willing to listen to my entire point. You see, there's all types of men in this world. There's men that will utter and mutter one or two phrases and be done. They've gone through a pretty tough life and they realized it doesn't make a lot of sense to talk and be very eloquent. Then there are other men who are very analytical and they have to go through a process in their mind to explain what's going on in their mind and to put that forward. Those people really required good listeners in their lives. Then there's all other, all other types of men out there literally who will not tolerate certain behaviors from men or women. I might literally be one of them, but how do I know? I haven't met every single person in the world, and I am not a lord over in their life. If someone literally doesn't have the time to listen, that's one thing. If they literally just want to walk away because they don't like what's being said, how mature is that in front of Jesus Christ? I don't recall any option, any verse in the literal Bible that said that Jesus literally just turned to the person and said, goodbye and walked away, or just walked away without a response of any kind. The Lord might have rebuked people. I literally get accused of that problem, that I rebuke people. I do. If you've lied to me about your care for me, I'm going to rebuke you for that. If you've lied because you think it's what makes people feel good, you should be rebuked for that. What makes people feel good is literally being heard. When a person says, I'm not going to listen to this anymore because it hurts my feelings, we have to look at it and go, okay, you're focusing on you, when something else in literally that someone is trying to express to you about them. You see, when a person's talking, it's not always about you. When a person is talking and processing information, he might or she might just literally be going through the motions of trying to think through what can they literally do next? How do they solve a problem? You see, most of the time we leave people alone unless we've got a problem to talk about, some sort of challenge going on, or we just literally want to gossip. Have a chat, if you will. In life, people prepare to harm others for those feelings of just wanting to chat or just wanting to give out some basic information to help someone do a better job. You see, in life, we've got moments in time to lord over others, or we have moments in time to go, this is my chance to extend extra grace required. EGR is what my eldest sister calls it, that there are literally some people at certain moments of time in their lives when they're under great duress and stress that literally just need a little extra grace in order for them to get through the situation and move on and beyond it. Now, this has been Blake Henson of Blaze Communications talking about the real world, talking about relationships, and talking about why making relationships so incredibly vital is so incredibly important.